Hi folks, before we get into this episode, I want to talk about the UK True Crime Podcast. It's a podcast which focuses on the lesser known crimes that have taken place primarily in the UK, and it offers new perspectives and insights into the stories you may already know. It's hosted by Adam, and if you like the style of the Troubles podcast, then this one is for you, with his delivery being direct and straight to the point. With a library of over 300 episodes, there are plenty to check out. He has some episodes related to the Troubles as well. You can listen by searching UK True Crime Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Now, let's get into it. This is the Troubles Podcast, a podcast about the violence and bloodshed that occurred in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain, as multiple sides and organisations waged a bloody conflict over the status of Northern Ireland. This week's episode of the podcast features my interview with Gero Jofailan. He did his PhD at the University of Limerick under Dr. Rune O'Donnell, looking at Irish republicanism in the South during the Troubles. He works in academic publishing and is currently living in Belfast. Geroge has just released a second book in his series focusing on the provisional IRA in the Republic of Ireland. We had a fascinating chat about the IRA's fertiliser bombs, conditions in Portleash prison, and whether the Irish government was doing enough to tackle republicanism in Ireland. So let's get into it then. We began our chat with Geroge telling me a little bit about himself. So I am... I'm from Shannon, County Clare, and I, th- I think this used to be quite well known, but I, I think it's not now. But in the 70s, the huge northern population in Shannon, um, kind of an anomaly, you know, like a lot of people who left the north during the, the outbreak of the Troubles, they went to Dundalk, Monaghan, you know, um, Donegal and so on. But quite a lot of people came down to Shannon because it was a planned town. It was a new town in the 60s. Yeah, the new town of, in Ireland, I think. Yeah, That's it, yeah. A lot of jobs there and... Um, I think in the early 70s, nearly 25% of the population was from the north. So it's a massive, massive, and really, an you know, like an island, um, you know, kind of surrounded by, you know, typically, you know, towns and villages where no one really leaves or, you know, there's no outsiders and so on. But um, my mother's from, the, from Belfast herself. When I was then doing my bachelor degree in history in Mary I, I was looking at, at that, you know, the kind of push and pull factors. Obviously, we all know the push factors for, for leaving the north, but what were the pull ones and how people ended up down here. Um, and I was interviewing people, I was doing a kind of an oral history uh, take on it. And just over the course of that, you know, and I was what, 20, 21 at the time, kind of thought I knew, you know, the troubles, knew my town. And suddenly you're getting all these stories, you know, because they're talking about, oh, and such and such stayed with us, you know, when they were on the run or before they got a flight to America. And, and you're hearing all this stuff that, you know, you, I, I never knew about. You know, really like um, about the South, about safe houses, training camps. And um, and I just got fascinated about that. You know, I finished finished up the Mary I and went on to do a PhD in UL on the South because it just, you know, even like when you read books, like the, the kind of the big books, Tim Pat Coogan's book on the troubles of the IRA, the, the big general books and um, general histories, they don't talk about this kind of stuff. They don't talk about, they might mention literally a sentence in the entire... Yeah, the Republic will probably get a paragraph in a couple of chapters, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And they're not going into that kind of stuff, training. Obviously, every single person, man and woman, who joined the IRA and the INLA um, during the 70s, 80s, 90s, had to do a training camp. Every training camp was in the South. So you're talking about thousands of people did training. And, you know, just the numbers are, are huge. And so yeah. things like that really, really hooked me. And so, yeah, I ended up doing this PhD. Took it as well as a bit of an oral history because... No, it was it was a bit bad timing because the Boston College kind of debacle with the um, yeah, with the oral history there was breaking out at the time I was doing it. So some people were reluctant to speak. But you know, I mean, a lot of people, even in the time that I was doing it, a lot of people who would have been involved in the South in the seventies would have been an older generation. You know, they would have been involved in the fifties, for example. So they were they were dying, and you know, each each person that died without leaving an account, that the, just the history that's lost the value to future generations. So I was trying to trying to just capture all that at the time. Okay, and specifically, so your PhD was um, the IRA in the Republic of Ireland. Yeah, that, it was exactly that. It was it was the IRA in the South. Um, I went up to eighty six because it was a neat split. You know, the split in the movement in eighty six when they voted to recognise Leinster House, Dáil Éireann. 
Um, so that was a kind of a neat thing. But I mean, the people I spoke to, they were talking about the 90s. My actually supervisor rang me and he was like, this is turning into journalism, not history. You know, it's getting a bit too recent. It's, it's a fine line. Yeah. And I think as well, you know, just like we were speaking before the recording about the, the legacy cases and, um, you know, people can obviously that, that that can still happen. You can still be prosecuted. There's no statute of limitations. I think people in the South are more wary about that because even though there has been, you know, post post ceasefire prosecutions and so on in the north there is a bit of a, a sort of understanding that it was almost an amnesty i mean it was the official secret amnesty letters but also that you know people are a bit more open to talk in the north whereas in the south it was never anything like that you know so i think people are are still much more wary to talk about what happened in the south yeah they, i guess they don't want to expose themselves so your first book then came out in 2019 and it was yeah. specifically was it 1969 79 yeah, I, I kind of, like, it says 80 on the title, but I, I didn't go into 80, really. You know, it was just, um, it was just kind of a neat, um, more of a kind of a, a stylistic reason to have it as 80. But, uh, you know, the, the second book really takes off and goes into 80 in detail. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like, you know, after, after the PhD, I, I worked, you know, like in a non, non-academia field. I was just working away and went back and kind of, um, did it. And I decided to, to break it up and, and do it because... The th- you know, the thesis was obviously pretty detailed, but I wanted to go into kind of more detail and, and expand out certain things, you know, and, and, and kind of make it a bit more more of a narrative, basically. So break it up into yeah. two different decades. But um, was there a reason you kind of decided to release these two volumes? No, uh, th- to be honest, it, it was really, you know, I mean, the, the troubles being 30 years, it's, it, it just kind of made sense to break it up into, into three decades. There was no, you know, I mean, like... There was nothing significant that really happened at the end of 79 to, to break up. It, w- it was actually just to have it as, you know, well, if I'm going to do kind of um, several volumes, I might as well break it up this way because, you know, otherwise you're kind of looking for, you know, you, you could do it in, in a way of like, okay, I'll end it, the hunger strikes, or, you know, I'll end that, the kind of the reorganization of the IRA in 75, 76. But um, no, I, I think it was just, it was just really, you know, doing it by decade. We then got straight into it. And I asked Geroj if he believed that the Irish government did enough during the Troubles to curtail the rise of republicanism and paramilitaries. The short answer, yes. I think they did. Um, you know, and, and I'll, I can expand on that. I think there's a lot, an awful lot they could be criticised for on both sides. You know, you can say, well, they didn't do enough to do X or Y. Or you could say, well, they, they curtail civil liberties to an alarming extent, you know, in a, in a way that we've never actually got back. You know, it's um, so I think that they can be criticized on both sides a lot. But they had to walk a very, very, you know, tight rope and um, throughout the conflict, uh, because, you know, on the one side, you had unionists in the north and the British and breathing down their necks about issues like extradition, which they didn't do until, you know, nearly 15 years into the conflict. Um, or actually 15 years into the conflict, you know, and, and they didn't, um, you know, they were giving more lenient sentences, things like this. There was a lot of criticisms like that. But at the same time, people in the South, and you saw this when extradition actually happened, it was one of the, the few things that could really kind of galvanize the population of the South in opposition to, you know, or in support, let's say, of republicanism in a way that only something like massively impactful and, and kind of time specific, like the hunger strikes of Bloody Sunday could do. Like people were willing to put up with a lot of, you know, things like special criminal court, juryless courts, you know, um, people going to jail just on the word of a superintendent without any evidence being proffered. People were willing to put up with that kind of stuff, but there was a there was always a line that they would not put up with anymore, you know, and, and extradition was one for, for more than a decade. And so the government, successive governments, I think, was, walked you know and successfully walked that tightrope um that they didn't you know they didn't go too far in terms of um let's say um being lenient to republicans and at the same time they didn't go so far as to kind of turn the the state into the, the type of state that the north was at the time you know in terms of the the containment of civil liberties as i'd recently covered an episode on frank stagg this season we began talking about how the Irish government handled the funerals of the early hunger strikers. The, the, the thing about that, right, you know, you look at the, the kind of procession that happened in 74 for, for Michael Goggin and that kind of crossed the country. But did it change anything? You know, it was like, they, could they not just have let that happen? Because it's, it's, not, it's not changing anything. At the end of the day, the people who are going to come out 
like I, I I think like I agree I think they handled it very badly um and they actually probably caused more people to turn you know against the government and towards yeah. populism by the way they handle it then if they just let it happen it would have looked bad would look you know very bad optics but I think at, you know after a week would that not have just died down again I I guess it was probably their relationship with the British government British government were probably saying, you know, for like the likes of Paisley up in North would, you know, be like, well, they're, they're, look at this, they're allowing this. And, and, and so, you know, and handed basically the IRA a great propaganda coup, you know, afterwards when they, when they reinterred the body, right? One such example of the Irish government trying to take action against Republicans was the introduction of the Special Criminal Court in 1972. I asked Gerroge why this came about. Yeah, so what what had happened was up until let's say from seventy seventy one and then into May seventy two, you know the, the troubles. Well, they, they were well kicked off by seventy two, but there was stuff happening in the south, training camps and and weapons and you know gel ignite stores being raided in quarries and and things like this, and so people were uh, you know with increasing regular regularity, people were appearing in court in the south in pretty much every county in the south for for IRA activity, but they were appearing in district courts. Because that that was the way it was run, and I remember membership at the time I think was six years. It was quickly re- um, brought up to two years later in the seventies. It was brought up to seven years, but um, in those years in seventy seventy one early seventy two, when they were appearing in you know and you can find this in the newspapers and I give quite a few examples in um in the first book when they were appearing in court these people they were often being acquitted by judges for you know a, a lack of evidence or or various things and. Often, you know, and particularly in Loud and in Monaghan and in Donegal, the judges would go up afterwards and shake their hand, or the juries would cheer and line up to shake their hand afterwards. So, it, you know, the, the point is, is that when the Special Criminal Court was introduced, it wasn't because there was jury intimidation. There was one single case of jury intimidation in the three years up to that introduction, but there was numerous cases of juries and judges um, just acquitting people and, and afterwards congratulating them. So, you know, the, the introduction of it, you know, as I say, the Constitution actually had it that they had to prove that they had failed due to intimidation and, and you know, and that we couldn't get juries because people were too afraid, whereas it was actually the opposite way around. And they were challenged by Noel Brown, who was a TD at the time, and another TD to provide the evidence for the introduction. And they just they just barreled through and just passed it. What actually happened was Jack Lynch, who was Taoiseach at the time, was pressured by the British government. They, the, the embassy, the, the British ambassador, provided Jack Lynch with a list of judges that he had gotten from looking at newspaper reports and said, these people are too in favour of the IRA. Now, you know, we can't draw an exact line because we don't know what private conversations took place after that, you know, that it was the British that forced him. But that is a fact that he was presented with this list of judges and subsequently um, the, the Special Criminal Court was introduced. And as you say, it was emergency legislation, which is why it has to be renewed every single year to the present. Yeah, I, I didn't know that at all. It's fascinating. Very yeah. interesting. And I guess, again, this is this was introduced early 70s, so there still would have been a lot of um, sympathy for the IRA, I guess. This was before some of the larger bombings that would kind of change the public opinion, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it was basically, um, it, it came on up until, like, pre, pre-Bloody pre Friday, let's say, which would have been, you know, the first of, of the kind of, there was, there was several, you know, basically bad, you know, atrocities before that, but Bloody Friday was the one I think that sticks in people's minds as being, and it is, you know, in terms of just the number of people killed and injured, one of the worst IRA acts of the Troubles. Yeah. We then started talking about whether the Irish government should have intervened in Northern Ireland as the violence began to escalate. You know, it's funny, like, as I say, you know, my, my mother's from, from the north and I live in Belfast and, you know, I, I, I speak to a lot of people and, and they do have this view. They didn't do enough. And, I, and and as I've also said, they walked a very tight line. You know, absolutely what they did in 69, I don't I don't know what they could have done. I mean, sending troops over the border would have been the absolute, yeah, the no, worst possible yeah. thing. Yeah, it, it, literally an act of war and, you know, and a terrible thing. They set up camps, you know, um, refugee camps. A very interesting word, actually, a very loaded word. People I spoke to down here, um, Funnily enough, it was um, there was one woman I interviewed and from Belfast, and she fled with her husband and their kids, and um, they were on Spring Springfield Road in '71, I think. And they were staying when they first got down here. They stayed with Christy Moore's mother. She put them up in Kildare. She was a Fine Gael counselor, 
But she said, never let anyone call you a refugee because you're in your own country. Refugee is someone from a different country. Yeah. So, you know, it, it also just shows the ambiguity. Um, you know, you can't just say all, all Fine Gaelers are partitionists or free statists or things like that. It's the very nuanced um, once you actually get into it. We, I, I, even I don't like it. It's easier to think in terms of, you know, blocks, but it's not the case. The topic of the Dublin Monaghan bombings then came up and how the bombings were carried out by loyalists in an attempt to turn public opinion against the IRA. Yeah, I think, I mean, that, that's that's certainly true. And, and that was exactly why they did it, right? Um, and, and they did it in 72 as well. Well, they did it in 72, actually. And the Barrett report shows this, that there was almost certainly there was British involvement in the 72 bombing, probably 74 as well. Um, and 72 was, you know, and um, literally those bombs exploded as they were debating um, an extension to the Offences Against the State Act and the Dáil. They heard the bombs explode as they were voting on this. And that vote was not going to pass. It was definitely not going to pass. Fianna Fáil, were, Fianna Fáil who were in power at the time, were actually going to vote against it. And the bombs went off and um, the, the, it subsequently passed. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of questions about that and, and, and why those bombs happened, you know, at the times that they happened. Though he didn't write it in the book, Geroge believed that though there was a narrative in the media that many people in the Republic of Ireland didn't support Republicans during the Troubles, in his eyes, there was a lot more nuance to it. But I think, while certainly, yes, a lot of people were turned off by the violence and, and didn't want to know about it, I, I think it's a bit over-egged. And I think, you know, this is a kind of, it's not something I talk about much in the book, because it's more of a, kind of a, I don't know, a theory that um, is, is a bit more c- conceptual than, you know, you want to just give a, a narrative of the troubles. But, like, I'll give you an example. The four years I was doing my PhD, you know, you're, you're living a normal life, you're kind of, going to college you know you're, you're visiting friends in different places you're going to shops you're going traveling you're going to the hospital when you're sick and stuff you're, you're interacting with a lot of people as you do as you live a normal life any time it came up that i was studying when i was studying you know someone would say oh what do you do and i would say i'm doing this people would suddenly talk and they would because i think because of what you were studying they felt that almost they were on safe ground and the stories you would get from people just normal people middle class working class people um i think belies the extent to which we think that people in the South weren't interested and didn't have pro-Republican sympathies. And I think, you know, if, if you think about um, the 70s, 80s, 90s, up to the present day, you know, digital media has changed a bit. But there is a kind of, you know, there's a, a trend, we'll say, within the media, you know, which is which is typically kind of, you know, it's it's centrist, but it's, it's it, it veers a bit towards, you know, anti-Republicanism. And I think there's a class issue in that. You know, and I think that's something we could we could talk about but um i think that that gives a a bit of a skewed perception of people's general attitudes and i think the kind of person then that would be let's say a columnist for the irish times or the irish independent or something who will will never um will say well look you know the people i talk to they they don't have any of this kind of a view it's like but that's because you're known as someone you know who's who's who has an anti-republican bias so why would anyone open up to you Whereas, you know, me, who was just very careful to never have any opinion either way when I spoke to people, I, I don't mean during my research, but actually when I just spoke to people in daily life about what I was studying, so I didn't know where they sat, almost invariably they would come up with kind of pro-Republican type stories or comments or remarks. And I, I found that just fascinating because that was not at all the, the perception I had. One of the most interesting takes that Gerroge had was in relation to class and how Republican paramilitary membership has changed from lower middle class to working class. To be honest, this entire topic merits an episode in itself, but we'll leave that till another day. Well, let's say, like, if you look at the 50s and you look at, you know, people like Sean South, Fergal and, and and you just look at the kind of, even something like fashion, um, you know, and, and as fashion goes over time, you look at the 50s and it was kind of more common to wear a shirt. It was more common to wear a tie and things like this. Um, and you, and then, and let's say you, you just kind of jump ahead to the present day and you look at an Easter parade and it's it's a lot of tracksuits you know and, and that's the kind of um, uniform I think I think one the kind of the the perception of the class that was involved in republicanism changed and I think the 60s was that kind of pivotal um time that it changed where it was kind of you know you, your view of the 1920s not your but like one's view of the 1920s would be lower middle class it was actually a lot more of that than, than working class, you know, and that's what studies have shown, it's kind of clerks, um, you know, people working at the kind of, um, 
that kind of lower level of, you know within merchants and and so on um and then i think by the 60s by the late 60s then you know and where it broke out and it broke out in a place that you know among a, a people that were kind of had 50 years of, of job discrimination and unemployment in in what was also a, typically a, an industrial area so that the the kind of particularly in the north no not in the south that's something i talk about in the book but particularly in the north then the the demographic of who was involved in republicanism was almost entirely active republic is not say instead of the kind of support based almost entirely working class and i think it's almost it's easier to demonize those people those people are probably less able to articulate their own views and and defend their own views you know when coming up against someone who's let's say third level educated from you know who went to trinity and and has a platform i.e you know um, like a newspaper to talk about it and I think, you know, that you had three decades where that was able to happen. And those people, you know, and you've, you've kind of standouts like Danny Morrison, who came from that working class Belfast background, but is just a very, very sharp mind and a very articulate yeah. guy. But they, they weren't in the minority, or sorry, they, weren't, they were in the minority and they had very few platforms to do so. So I think, I think it was easier to demonize those people because they were because of that class i think it's it, it's easier to demonize working class people well you could almost throw out a hot take on that like that if you look at the likes of Sinn fein now like Sinn fein have been lambasted for a long time in irish politics now again of course because they had a direct pipeline to to paramilitaries but but you know the Sinn fein image has changed so much in the last 15 20 years and almost into well i i just a different kind of you know that they're, they're I, I hate to say the word polished you know but they're kind of I know they're appealing to younger generations now who don't remember what, what happened, I guess. But at the same time, they're really polishing their image and maybe trying to not look like working class. And again, this is all hypothetical stuff, but it does kind of, it's, it's a really good point. So I, I'm, I'm always fascinated with class and the troubles because I think they really do go hand in hand, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I, and you're right, you know, I mean, well, like Chuck Agarmani as a, as a kind of a jive at Sinn Féin, that's nearly 20 years old now, it probably is. Um... And it's it is a debate. I think that those kind of debates happen within um, Sinn Fein in the nineties and early two thousands. It was look, we have to play them at their game. You know, we're not gonna we're not gonna convince people otherwise. Like we have to we have to do these kind of things in order to to be able to get more of a platform in order to espouse our views. Because if we just keep kind of, you know, being yeah, being kind of um, the way we are and, and speaking the way we are and speaking bluntly the way we we do, we're only convincing our own people. You know, whereas you have to convince the others. We then started talking about the provisional IRA and where things lay as we went into the 80s and how they restructured with the phasing out of brigades and the introduction of active service units. Okay, yeah, coming into the 80s, I, just to go back then a few years to explain what they were coming into the 80s was that you had the ceasefire, 75, 76, um, which, you know, there's a bit of revisionism about it now. Like the, the traditional view is that it was a disaster for the IRA. People say, well, it wasn't so bad. I think it was. You know, they, they were on ceasefire. They broke it occasionally, um, particularly with sectarian attacks. There was a tip for tap um, with, with loyalists at the time, um, which a lot of them we now know and, and has come out is that they were, it was, it was British agents involved in that. What the, what the British were in, interested in at the time, and again, this is, what, what these things are like, the, rather than opinion, this is just, you know, this is the traditional accepted, you know, we have records of this now. What the British were interested in when they were engaged in talks with Sinn Féin in 75, 76, they were kind of leading them on, you know, oh yeah, we might, you know, we're, we're, talk, we're thinking about a, a withdrawal, an announcement for withdrawal and so on. But what they were actually doing, you know, and, and Republicans within the movement were warning about this at the time, they were building the H-blocks, you know, these massive, um, you know, when you see it from the air, the H-blocks, a huge structure, you know, infrastructure of prisons, um, of prison buildings. And, you know, some people were saying, look, they're not planning on going anywhere. They were phasing out internment, internment ended in 76. And um, what they were doing was, there was a, was a kind of a several pronged approach. One was to split the Iron and Sinn Féin. You know, because, and it, they nearly did split over it because some people wanted, you know, believed in that the British were negotiating in good faith and others didn't. So there was that like really um, big divide. And it, it, the movement didn't split afterwards in a formal sense, but it did split in terms of people fell out. Um, the other thing they were doing was building up their intelligence on the IRA because people who had been on the run for years and had been watching their backs and you know had been in the south and so on were suddenly walking the streets 
and the British were keeping tabs on everyone. They were building up um, a huge database, the likes that they didn't have previously, um, on who was a Republican, who was talking to who, and so on. Um, and the other, thing... had, if, if you don't mind me, sorry to interrupt you there, but um, so how would they do that in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, then? Oh, no, sorry, I'm just talking about the the North in that in that sense. Okay, okay. Yeah, although there was in- there was intelligence sharing between Britain and Ireland at the time. Yeah. Oh, Britain Britain always felt that the South wasn't giving them enough, and yeah. the South was was very begrudging about it. And I think there was, I think there was an element of pride in that. You know, it's like, well, look, you know, you're the traditional enemy. Like, don't tell us how to do our job. And and I think you know, and some of them also they may not have been pro Republican, but they weren't pro British. You know, and and yeah, of course, they're, they're humans at the end of the day. But the the third thing then, and this worked for the North and the South. Um, people got used to peace. You know, it was easy to support the IRA when the British were in your streets, you know, beating you up, taking your name, harassing you, you know, um, all this kind of stuff. When they backed off a bit and when there wasn't bombs going off, there wasn't shootings, you know, in, on the Falls Road, for example, people obviously got used to that. They didn't want to go back to that, to, to the violence. And that was part of it was to drag it out to such a point that their own community would stop supporting them. So, this is just a, yeah, this is a bit of a, a long answer, but when the ceasefire broke down then, in early 1976, the IRA went went back to the conflict. 1977 was their lowest point in terms of, just in terms of activity, in terms of you know, what they would consider successful activity, in terms of, um, you know, uh, attacks on the British Army, attacks on the RUC and the economic bombing campaign. So they were, they were at a, almost at a collapsing point in 77. And then you had a, a massive restructure. That's where the active service units came in. The brigade structure was was gotten rid of, except in people say except in South Armagh, but also except in Kerry. <laughs> it was just yeah, yeah. In, in Kerry, there was, there was so many of them, and and for the same reason, people say well, in South Armagh, there was such a strong pro Republican, you know, that whole there being no league work at all. Yep, same thing happened in Kerry. Yeah, so they just kept they just kept at it. They said yeah, yeah, we'll do this, and just went their own way. <laughs> But uh, typical carry. But so you're going into the 80s, that was it. Like it was a, it was restructured, much more slimmed down organization. They didn't need the number of volunteers. They had nearly, nearly 70s, you had hundreds. Belfast, you had a couple of hundred getting involved. They didn't need that anymore. You know, they needed um, kind of, you still had a large support, uh, like community around it, safe houses, things like this, intelligence. But the actual active volunteers going out, doing the bombing, shooting, and um, they were able to slim that down to several hundred across the entirety of um, the island. Slim it down, tighten it up, I guess. Yeah. Slim it down, yeah, tighten it up. And no, we know that that didn't work so well in terms of tight, um, you know, leaks and, and, and informers and so on and um, British agents. But that was the, the intention. But they, they were at a kind of a very low point in terms of weapons by by the, the late 1970s. Now you had the we- Libyan weapons come in the year in 72, 73. Um, you had weapons always coming in piecemeal from the from America. Still, you know, like throughout the thirty years, there was a a failed shipment came in that was supposed to go in from Belgium. In there was one from Amsterdam in, or in um, Netherlands in seventy three, and had a big one from Belgium in seventy seven. And there was actually in Dublin there was a, a man sh- was killed, he was shot in a pub, um, as a result of that leak in um, seventy. I think it was seventy eight. And um, just off the by the liberties, he was shot. And uh, a guy went to did a life sentence for murder in the eighties. He confessed to it. So, so that was a big weapons shipment that was supposed to come in, and it didn't. But they did get a few successful. Like they got the first time they got um, general purpose machine guns was 1978. They were stolen, stolen, you know, appropriated from a, a marine base in the U.S. Probably by Irish American soldiers, um, and they were brought over, and they were. Um, Unve- unveiled at the, I think it was the Easter commemoration in 1978 in Derry. So going into the 80s, yeah, much more slimmed down, much more kind of, um, I would say, like, um, it, it, it wasn't kind of a spasmodic campaign of, you know, just attack where you can, when you can. It was more, you know, um, planning going into things. Uh, you know, the, the attack on the paratroopers in Warren Point at the end of 1979 demonstrates that it was the largest single loss of life for the British Army since the Second World War. Um, but they didn't have a lot of the weapons that they wanted in order to kind of, now that they knew what they were doing and they had this slim down thing, they needed kind of high grade modern weaponry. They they didn't have an awful lot of that going into the 80s. And they didn't have much money, I'd say, to buy it as well. 
No, no, money was always a problem, always a problem. Yeah. But, and, and this is what I talk about in the first book. In my view, the, the IRA was bankrolled, not by the South now, but a lot by the South and the North. In the North, you had the, the social clubs and you had things like car parks, which doesn't sound like much, but, you know, as, as, as was said to me, if, if you just kind of put down on the books that, um, you know, you made 12 grand in terms of, you know, car parks and, um, in a week, but you actually made 20, then that's eight grand you can siphon off a week to, you know, to the movement. So it's, it, it does add up a lot, but in the South, it was bank robberies, um, or rather armed robbery, so post offices as well. That yeah, was. What's you say? What's you say in your book? It was like there was like it was over around two hundred and fifty in one year or something, or it was a huge number. Yeah, yeah. Now, not all of those were the IRA. Like, yeah, like you say, like you're literally talking about one more than one every second day. That that would be in the newspaper, armed robbery. Now, when I say most, about maybe forty percent of them were the IRA, but all of the big. With the exception of one or two, all of the big um, robberies, because mo- some of them might be 200 pounds stolen, but all of the big ones, you know, we're talking like 10 grand plus up to, you know, a quarter of a million, they were all the IRA. And that was, now it was units based in the South. Some of those were people from the North. A lot of them were people from the South because that was their role. Your role was to provide training and your role was to provide, provide funding. Okay. And I'm curious, like, um, I guess it, it varies, but around this time, would they be making similar amounts coming in from the US do you think or was it mo- like the vast majority was robberies in the south vast majority was robberies the, the, the America you know money was coming in regularly from the likes of Norad um, and you know and there's a big debate well did Norad give money to the IRA and you know I, I think they did but that can't be proven but even if they didn't if Norad was giving money to the prisoners dependence fund for example that meant that that money that was being raised for the prisoners could go to the air. You know, it basically, it was yeah, an offsetting be, measure. Yeah, going through another layer or whatever. Exactly. Just a quick note to say that if you are enjoying this podcast and want to support it, you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash the troubles podcast. I've been filling up the private Patreon feed for over three years now and have a huge amount of Patreon exclusive content for you to check out. Each episode gets its own companion video where I talk about what's happening in Northern Ireland right now, as well as some additional details that came up after the release of the episode. I also have some Patreon-only episodes, such as one all about the troubles in popular culture and the songs that came out of that period. And just last week, I released a Patreon-exclusive interview with Kevin Owens, who was in the Irish Army patrolling the Irish border in the 90s, and he had some very interesting stories to tell. If you have been enjoying this podcast over the last few seasons, and would like to help me turn this into a full-time job, you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash the Troubles Podcast. Thank you. I then asked Gerard how the IRA got their explosives during this period, and I found the answer fascinating. The vast majority of explosives were coming from the South, but it was homemade. So in the in this early 70s, so 70, 71, kind of dried up by 72, but 70, 71, you're talking about every every quarry, every council place in in you know council building in the south was being raided for for gel ignite, so that commercial explosive. Um, it it tried up in the by seventy two because legislation was brought in. So for example, this is a mad thing. Up until nineteen seventy two, anyone who was a rate payer, you know, so like anyone who, who owned a property, could go into their local council. So you go to Ennis, you know, Clare County Council, and they had to give you a list of everywhere in the county that stored explosives. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, yeah. And so, you know, you, people just knew exactly everywhere that explosives are being held. And so they were all being stolen. They were, you know, they were obviously being used as, as explosives in the North, but sometimes they were captured and, and the gel ignite, which, you know, they're, they're sticks. They look like a stick of dynamite. It's kind of yellowishy color. And it would say, you know, it would have a stamp on it, you know, of the, the, the county council. So, you know, the, the British understandably were going to the government saying, what, what the hell are you doing here? You know, you need yeah. to tighten up. The, so there's, there was the two big mines in Ireland. The, the, two, the two ones that I talk about are, are, are the Arigna mines, which is up in so Roscommon, Leitrim, and um, Leitrim. And then you have the, the silver mine in Tipperary. And that was, I mean, that, that was happening all throughout the 70s as well into the 80s, where, as you say, people were bringing home sticks in their lunch boxes. Several soldiers went to jail and did um, hard labor because they were actually, they were tasked with, you know, searching the miners and, and protecting the mines. They were stealing them. And um, so, yeah, that case I mentioned in the book is that in 82, 
they they discovered that there was a, a, a massive raid on the mine and they, they, they took all these um, commercial explosives and they were some of them were discovered in the north but a lot of them were actually just put to use and the, the Irish government warned the British government that about this raid and it was considered I mean they used the term uh, mission impossible you know they went down a kind of a, an adjacent uh, mine and actually went you know underground for a mile or so or half a mile to this place stocked up everything but took you know the, the, the exact amount they took um, they also took the, the kind of corresponding number of detonators that you would need so it's a really kind of meticulously planned out thing but I, I came across this story in, in the newspapers when I was doing research back for the PhD and it was only a couple of months before that I had been interviewing a fella from Munster and he told me about this case he didn't mention that he just said oh there was a time where you know the, the, we, the exposed were being taken out regularly lunch boxes and the foreman was not doing his job properly in terms of inventory so when he finally did do an inventory it was all this gone so he actually went and reported that there was a big raid rather than admit that he hadn't done inventory for several months so I don't know what the truth is but I came across the newspaper thing and said Jeez, this is the story he was telling me about and, yeah yeah uh, and then there was something else that I think you mentioned then so again you'll know this better than I do but I guess was there a movement then to change the makeup of fertilizer so that the fertilizer that can be used to make bombs couldn't be used to make bombs anymore. Was that kind of the the standards across Ireland changed or something? Or how, yeah. how did that work? Yeah, and, and it's a kind of a, a mad story about that as well, which is similar to what I just mentioned. So in the, in the early 70s, they discovered, the, the IRA discovered, it was Jack McCabe who was the first quartermaster for the Prisional IRA. He was actually killed um, making explosives. He was um, cooking fertilizer, so you're boiling it. But what it, okay, yeah, I mean, it's, it's find this online, probably be the FBI will find you as well. But it, yeah, so you, you get it, you, you, you get it, and it's like, um, it's like granularly, if you ever see, you see fertilizer. You put it in a trough and you, you heat it on a very, very low heat, and you keep um, turning it. And it, the, what the heat does is it burns off all the stuff that you don't need. So you've, um, you've ammonium nitrate, and uh, it, get, it basically gets rid of all, what you're left with at the end is little tiny white granules and you mix that with oil and then and that's what you have that's what you you, you get your explosive now that's an engine just like, what all you have to do is ignite that and yeah and if it, 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 you need something to set it off and and so in the early 70s the, the gel ignite i mentioned that commercial explosive in mind they were there was so much of that that they were they were just blowing that up you know and then when that started drying up they were still able to get small amounts of it throughout the 70s but they were using that as a booster, basically. Like so a primer, yeah, or yeah. A primer, exactly, because this other stuff needs something like that. It needs a high, you know, sh- sharp shock, high intensity. Yeah, you can't just hold a, you can't hold a match to it or anything. You need to exactly. Do. Yeah, they do it with Semtex. You, apparently you can throw that into a fire, campfire. It just burn all night. So. Probably won't test that out. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know the guy, when he told me, he's very brave, he did that, like, so, yeah. but, um, so what happened in the early 70s was they, they discovered this method. And as I mentioned, Jack McCabe, he was actually turning it and he was using a shovel and the um, shovel hit the concrete, caused a spark. So um exploded. He, he, he lingered for a few days in the hospital. But um, so they, they, they found this way. And at the time, the, the fertilizer in Ireland was almost 100% um, in terms of it had the, the ammonium nitrate. It was nearly 100%. And... Um, it's calcium carbonate is the other kind of um, makeup of it. And so that's what you need. So that, you know, you're talking about, you're, you're getting really kind of bang for your buck in terms of um, the amount that you can convert into an explosive. Now, the reason for that, seemingly, is that the Irish grass apparently doesn't have a very high um, nitrogen amount. And so, and the cattle need this. So that's why there was such a high amount of nitrate in this fertilizer. So the British government put pressure on the Irish government. Um, what they did was they changed their fertilizer the one that was available in, in the north, they put pressure on the Irish government to, to do the same. They said, look, you know, and, and they made a very good case for that. You'd see him in 72 was just bombings every single day nearly in the north. So the Irish government did change it. They brought it from about 98% ammonium nitrate down to 74%. And that cost huge money. You know, you have to change your entire production line and the material in them. There was a big one in Wexford, huge fertilizer plant. There's, there's one somewhere else. So it's a huge cost, and obviously then the, the there's less uh, the, the farmers need to buy more of it basically in order to continue you know providing their cows with the amount of nitrogen they need for for dairy. 
So there was a huge cost on the farmers and there was a huge cost on the government. So in the late 70s, then the British government said, look, that's still too much. That 74 is still too much. Um, you need to reduce it again. The Irish government pushed back and they said, look, you know, we, we lost money. We're still losing money hand over fist as a result of these practices. So are our, our farmers who we have to subsidize. So they, they didn't want to do this. So the British government said, well, look, let's work together on finding a way to make the current fertilizer, to make it in such a way that it can't be, you can't extract the ammonium nitrate from it, turn it into an explosive. And the Irish government, over the course of about five more years, kind of hummed and hawed, and sometimes they were in favor of this, and sometimes they you know, did a bit of R&D with the British government, and sometimes they didn't. And I think a lot of that was due to the fact that Irish governments, quite a few changes of Irish government at the time, each one had their own policies and so on. Yeah. And then the hunger strikes, obviously, that soured relations for quite a while between the governments. But what happened was the British ended up pouring, you know, the equivalent nowadays of, I would say, tens of millions into research, into how can we make the fertilizer in such a way that you can't extract explosives. The Irish government provided labs for them to do it as well, and they collaborated with them in Ireland. And eventually, um, in the, I think around 85, they found a way. They said, okay, look, the, the fertilizer now, it's got a coating, basically a new coating around each granule that you can't, um, you can't boil it down. Now, again, before I ever came across this, I only came across that a few years ago in the archives in, in London. About 10, 12 years ago, I was interviewing a guy for the PhD. Down in here, he was, he was involved in the quartermaster department in Southern Command. And he just happened to mention, just in passing this story, he said, oh yeah, in the, in the 80s, we went from boiling it to grinding it. And you mentioned mangles, so those big industrial things that you use when you're doing um, laundry, you know, that like flatten out. There's two rollers and they flatten out something that you run it through. And he said that we use mangles and, and industrial coffee grinders. And I just, you know, filed that away in the back of my head. Well, that's interesting. What happened in the British, um, when the British created this new fertilizer, and I, I remember reading it in the report, it was just this eureka moment. They said, this can't be boiled, but there's one potential downside. They added this caveat in the report. They said, if they're impacted in a certain way, it, it can break the coating and then you can actually get at it. And they found this out because I think they actually dropped some of the fertilizer and in whatever way it dropped, the, these, these small little granules, the, the coating was damaged. So they said, look, don't tell anyone about this, basically. Like, this is the one way that... And, and some, somehow the IRA found it out. So, you know, all this nearly eight years of research, tens of millions, you know, all this energy going into making this and the IRA said oh, we just we just stopped boiling it we just got mangles and they continued the same and not just continued the same but the year after that was introduced the, the largest bombs the IRA ever used using um, homemade explosives were detonated and discovered in the north so it had absolutely no impact on their capabilities so I wonder was it just a really good research and development unit of the IRA or was it um, a little bit more than that you know was there obviously some information that came down to them because you know, it's very interesting to, to to question which of the two it is. You know, yeah, you'd wonder, and it was con. It, that was like you know, it's like an arms race constantly throughout the troubles. Anytime the British would have a countermeasure, the IRA would try and find a way around it, and so on. Well, what, what I've what I've heard is, um, in a lot of cases, the British Army had to, you know, the the British Army would ha only really be able to research a bomb after it's gone off and figure out, okay, how did they detonate this. What was, you know, what was, so it was, it was always a cat and mouse game, but the IRA in a lot of cases seemed one step ahead, um, you know, strang strangely enough. It did. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, like what I argue in the book is that, and you know, my belief is that the, the troubles went on as long as they did, because there was a number we'll never know, like an unknown number, but a, a hugely significant proportion of the population of the South, um, you know, had sympathies or support for for republic, militant republicanism. But a large percentage of that would be soft, you know, would be kind of passive. And that that population particularly would be seriously turned off, you know, and, you know, disgusted by, by the killing of Gardy and would make those feelings known verbally to republicans, but also by saying, well, no, you can't use my land anymore. No, I'm not going to, you know, help you out anymore. So I think the 80s, the 80s was the worst year in terms of care to fatalities. Um, I think actually during the Troubles, you know, not just the IRA, but there was there was other killings. And I think that's because armed robberies, you know, there was, there was people who were killed by kind of normal, let's say non, non um, Republican um, armed robbers as well, because I think the IRA kind of introduced the gun into robberies. A number of Irish Gardaí were also killed by the IRA during the Troubles. 
So I put the question to Gerhard if this hurt the IRA's cause. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the killings, like I, I remember I spoke to a, a fella and he said to me, you know, we accepted that whenever a guard was killed and, and there was a strict rule within, you know, the IRA's actual constitution, General Standing Order Number 8, was that if you ever came up against um, soldiers, the Irish Army soldiers or the Gardaí, what your priority was was to get away, was to cache your weapons and to escape. And under no circumstances are you ever to engage. Now, part of that was pragmatic. Part of it was, you know, they, they didn't view them as the enemy. Some people from the north and the south did, you know, and, and that's that's a different story. But it was pragmatic because they tried they tried to go up against the 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 guards in around about the late thirties, early forties, when you know Dev was in power and you had the Second World War, and that's when you had the first offences against the State Act, and the state just crushed them. You know, it executed several IRA members and it just interned them, just rounded up hundreds of them and turned them into Kura. And so the, the IRA knew that we can't do this. We can't afford to take on the state. And, you know, one of the reasons that the, the South never introduced internment was they never had a, a strong enough reason to. And the IRA knew that as well. It's like, if we start killing guards or we make that a policy, they'll introduce it and they'll crush us. So there was a very, there was a very pragmatic bent to it. But yeah, just to get back to it, there was a guy who was saying to me, he said, look, we accepted that if a guard was killed, the gloves came off. That was the term he used. You know, they would round up every known Republican within the area and you'd be beaten. You'd just be beaten, you know, in, in, in the station to the point of hospitalization, as has happened in many, many occasions. And and they accepted that. It's like, we, you know, we didn't want that. No, it's like even someone who says, well, I don't care if a guard dies, but I don't want them to because. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if, you know, and they're going to they're going to find weapons that are in transit because this person didn't know that they, you know, that this was happening at the time. So they were going about their other public activity well, you're going to find there weapons there also was the case of i guess the blind eye you know that in maybe some cases i don't know what it would be guardy probably but with the irish army as well like if they're not coming for us and you know i think there was many cases of just turning the other way turning the other way those are heading north across the border you know i don't know if you agree or disagree or but I, I feel like that probably happened a good bit it did yeah absolutely i mean you know down here I know people, it's people who would have been involved in the 50s, so they would have been kind of middle-aged in the 70s, 80s, um, and still involved, but on the margins. And Garrett's saying that to them, saying, look, just don't do anything blatant. Don't force me to come after you. And that, you know, and that was that was said to people across the 26 counties. Um, you mentioned in your book that, the, I guess, Portlaoise Prison, um, I guess this was probably in the wake of, I think, was it the killing of Garrett or was it the targeting of prison officers in Portlaoise that suddenly... The Portlaoise prison guards just, like the, the prison just became very severe. I don't know, was it for all inmates or was it just for uh, paramilitary inmates or wh why Why was it like that? Was it just a bad, bad, a badly run prisoner or was it, was there just a lot of animosity between the two groups? I think uh, uh, just to, just to correct one thing, they, they never targeted um, wardens in Portlaoise. Uh, there was a, the, the chief warden was killed by, and it was by the IRA, but that was against policy. Um, so there was a there was a policy of never actually going after because they could make life very tough for of um, prisoners inside. What happened? What actually happened was things apparently got really bad in '76, and it was actually Martin Ferris said to me that he believes that the Irish government, when they seen you know you had the, the phasing out of um, special category status, basically political prisoner status in the north in '76, um, you know, and then you had what led to you know the dirty protest and, and the I sorry the blanket and then the dirty protest. Ferris believes that the Irish government were bringing their policies in line with what was going on in the North. So, you know, no more kind of toleration of, you know, Republican trappings within the prison. No more, you know, whether that's um, plain clothes or the ability to drill in the square, you know, and, and have a kind of a military structure within the prison. So it, it, it was in the 76 is when it got very bad and you had a hunger strike in 77. You had one in 75 as well, but you had a big one in 77. Um, quite a few people who were on that hunger strike died in their early 40s. Um, people like um, Pat Ward from Donegal, um, Mick Brody and Clare. So quite a, quite a few. Ty O'Connell even, you know, who was adjutant the IRA. He died very young. I believe it was because of the hunger strike. But it it got very bad at that point. Now, in fairness, you know, like while well, there was a lot of kind of pressure, you know, and and, and brut brutality brought on the Republican prisoners, they were also trying to escape an awful lot. You know, a yeah, like they exploded a bomb in Port Leash and so on. So life was very tough for the warders as well. But it, it got it got progressively worse. It didn't get better. It got worse for about a decade. 
Um, the, the visiting conditions were, were terrible. You were, you know, you were maybe 12 foot away from your, your family member. Um, there was, there was visits cut short because people spoke Irish. Um, any kind of, you know, any kind of criticism of the government would be cut short. You had people who would travel, you know, from Donegal back then, it was about a six hour trip one way. Um, and they would just be told, no, you're not allowed to see your son today. Things like this. So it was, it was very bad within the prison and there was, as I say, brutality. And there was a lot of um, strip searching. Strip searching, you know, I think people might be familiar with this if you've ever seen the film Hunger. But, you know, it's not as simple, you know, take your clothes off and stand there. It was a really brutal exercise and you'd be spread nice. angled over a mirror. Yeah, and, and what they would deliberately do, you know, is they would they would check your anus first and then your mouth with the same gloves. You know, it was, it was deliberate humiliation and, and brutality. So... But what, what ended up happening was, this was very well known, Amnesty were, were raising this regularly. Um, the Irish Council of Civil Liberties were raising this regularly, but it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't getting traction. The government didn't care. But what actually happened was the Port Leash Prison Officers Association came out and said, we don't want to do this. We're being told to brutalise these people. And if we don't, we're getting bullied within the, 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 the our jobs and we're being called provo lovers and we're being you know, um, like it's it's being spread that we're actually sympathizers. We don't want to have to do this kind of stuff. So it was a really, really odd situation that was happening in Port Leash, where apparently it was a small number of wardens, um, senior wardens who were directing this and guards who were allowed to come in drunk. Uh, but that was the accusation now, but it was, it was several priests attested to this. It was guards coming in drunk and um, picking fights with the prisoners, you know, and, and, and then attacking them like, you know, several guards to one prisoner kind of thing and reading out their letters and making fun of you know the letters and the spelling within the the letters and stuff like this just kind of deliberately kind of humiliating things dehumanizing yeah yeah dehumanizing the thing is it finally got to a point where there was a almost a, a compromise reached and they actually scaled back for the first time in nearly 10 years they in 10 years they had you know more humane visiting conditions now within a couple of weeks the IRA tried to escape mass escape you know so it's just like yeah straight away it yeah. comes back in well look glad you had your chance and you ruined yeah. it it's an impossible position I guess exactly yeah we then moved on to talking about Dublin in the early 80s which was in the grip of a heroin epidemic I asked Geroid what connection if any the IRA had to this epidemic yeah it, it, it's 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 an ongoing debate really actually the, the extent of the relationship like I, I borrowed a term um, in the book and I wrote a paper on this uh, uh, years back it was the, the big bluff so I mean you had this this heroin epidemic and, and just to say about that like Dublin in 1981-82 had a higher heroin rate addiction rate among teenagers than New York or Paris or Brooklyn it was the worst in the western world um, I think you're like in some parts of Dublin it was 12-13% of 16 year olds were addicted to heroin like unimaginably horrific uh, and the government's Successive governments did nothing about this, you know, and this is, you know, this is kind of reports coming out of um, Trinity subsequently about this, like drugs task force. The government did nothing. They didn't, they didn't really care. Now, guards have come out since and said, we wanted to go after drug dealers, but we were told to go after paramilitaries, you know, that like, but, you know, if you're the, the kind of the person living in, in somewhere like Crumlin, you know, and, and you're worried about your kids, you don't care you know, about, you just know the guards aren't doing anything. You can literally see the drug dealers. They they just hang outside all day dealing drugs, and there's no guards. So they did. They families in um, like North Inner City Dublin went to the the official IRA first, who were still big at the time in, in a kind of secretive way, and asked them. They said, "Look, here's the names of the drug dealers. Here's dresses. Will you go and shoot them?" And they said, "No, we don't do that." And then they went to the provisionals and they said, "Will you do this?" And they said, "No, look, we don't do that." And the provisionals, it was a very pragmatic thing as well. It's like, well, if we start doing this, the guards are going to come down on us. We're trying to, you know, prosecute this conflict in the north. So it was, it was a very pragmatic thing. But at the end of the day, the huge, um, huge numbers of Dublin people involved in the IRA or on the margins of it in those areas. So it was their kids, you know, who were who were with this problem. So the the other neighbours were saying, why can't you do something? You know, you know where there's guns. Why can't you go? You don't even have to. Um, shoot, just go and threaten them. They know who you are. They'll be afraid of you. And so it kind of, you know, it was very, um, nothing, none of this was planned. This kind of evolved. So the, the first way they did it was they just, you know, a group of people went to a drug dealer's house. They gave them an ultimatum to get out. They didn't. So the, the, the whole, almost like the whole community went in and removed their furniture 
and they formed a line so that everyone touched it so that everyone was culpable so the guards would have to prosecute you know 60 people or whatever it was and they and that worked now you can come you know and people have come and criticized and they've criticized at the time and said well look you didn't address the issue you know the drug dealers went somewhere else and dealt drugs but it's like if you're the if you're the family member like you don't care like you just you got it rid of it get out of my back garden yeah exactly and and like how can you blame anyone for you know for doing that you know and, and not thinking about you know well how do we systematically address this issue but what happened was it was kind of let no one then to because you had some very prominent people like Christy Burke who was Sinn Féin he wasn't elected rep at the time but he was the kind of representative in the area around North Hardick Street um he was he but he'd been like he'd been in jail I think twice at that point in the 70s for IRA membership he was caught in a training camp and I don't know if he was in the IRA at the time you know um, but he was certainly in Sinn Féin and he was known he was a known Republican John Noonan was another one they were so they were always put at the front of these marches you know when they would march to a drug dealer's house and so that and that's the big bluff it was kind of well are they you know is this an IRA thing is it not and so people the drug dealers would be afraid but it was also let known to these groups. And as they started coalescing, actually formalizing into Concerned Parents Against Drugs and formed branches around the city, it was let known, look, if something happens, or if drug dealers kick back, we'll get involved. Um, but without without ever getting the sanction of the leadership of the IRA, because they would never have allowed that. Now, the thing is, and, and it did happen, you know, there was a guy who was involved in Concerned Parents Against Drugs was shot in the legs. And um, but very shortly after that, uh, a known criminal was abducted by the IRA and he was held for nearly a fortnight. And then they tried to abduct uh, Martin Foley, the Viper. And they, it was five guys were caught or four were caught and one got away. Um, the, the, the guards um, happened to, you know, neighbors called um, when they saw him being abducted from his house. But what, what, what had happened then was basically the Sinn Féin particularly which was starting to get much more of a become more of an equal partner in the relationship it was always the poor cousin in the 70s but in the 80s was becoming much more powerful post hunger strike they saw what was happening they and they could see and, and Jerry Adams had this famous line you, it was, you can't get votes in Ballymun for doors being kicked down in Ballymurphy you know we need to actually get involved in activism in the south um, and, and they saw that and they and they and like subsequently I mean 1999 because it was there was several like iterations of concerned parents but 1999, good number, it was like the, the highest Sinn Féin um, vote in terms of in the council elections that had happened since the 20s in Dublin. And half of those people were prominent in the anti drugs movement. I still remember signs, uh, one place in Dublin anyway, I still remember signs up saying needle-free zone, you know, so yeah, something that obviously was, was a, ma- a massive issue. Yeah, I, like the the thing just on, like on, on crime in general, thing, well, drugs, right, it's, it's, it's a couple of things. One is it'll alienate the communities they're in. But two, they are those communities. You know, so they don't like drugs either. Yeah. Um, you know, and there'll be a lot of like alcohol aside, almost straight edge, you know, in the, in their mentality. You know, like grass is as bad as heroin kind of thing. Um, but the other the other element to that, and this is one of the reasons also why, you know, the IRA shot petty criminals in, in the north, particularly in Belfast, it's not just because they're preying on their own communities. It's because they are the people that the police will pick up and turn out to be an informer because they have you know leverage on them because they're dealing drugs or something. So that's why you don't want criminals in your community if you're the IRA. It's because they are the people who the, the guards or the REC are going to use as informers. In one of the previous episodes, I covered the discovery of the Exund, which was a ship laden with weapons, explosives and ammunition destined for Ireland. It turned out that this shipment was the fifth shipment to come into the country in recent years from Libya but the first to be caught. With the realisation that there was a significant amount of weapons in the Republic of Ireland, the Irish Gardaí launched what became known as Operation Mallard as an attempt to find some of these weapons. I asked Geroid about the efficacy of this operation. Yeah, yeah, largest operation, security operation in the history of the state. So 60,000 homes searched. And was it, would it be considered very successful or was it moderately successful or what? No, no, I, it was a failure. Um, so it, it was a, it was an immediate failure. Um, in subsequent years, they got a lot of the Libyan weapons, but like Mallard was, you know, a, a time bound operation. What had happened was when they when they realized all these weapons had actually landed in the country. So as I say, like sixty thousand houses. They even, you know, they searched islands off the the coast. They searched um, mobile home parks. They searched boats on the rivers uh, or on the Shannon, you know, and in Loch Ree and in Loch Derg. They searched kind of any anywhere they could find. 
and they got almost nothing. And I mean, literally, you know, you could count on one hand kind of the amount that they got. And when you consider there was thousands and thousands of AK 47s, you know, hundreds of general purpose machine guns and millions of rounds and, you know, and, and everything and grenades and pistols, and they got none of it. And what they did uncover was bunkers. Um, purpose-built bunkers on farmland in several places that were waiting. They were basically primed for um, to be used as storage points. So it's almost like they were, you know, it was great that they got these because then these bunkers could never be used, but they were almost um, too early. What had happened was that the weapons that had come in were stored in master dumps. There was only three or four of them in the Munster, we'll just say Munster. And these are, you know, and we're talking like massive, massive underground things that couldn't be picked up by... Um, aerial surveillance because that's what they that's how they found some of these bunkers and it couldn't be picked up by metal detectors they were too deep or, or any kind of like leader lighter or anything that was available at the time and they were going to be broken up and moved into these smaller bunkers which are still still sizable bunkers but that hadn't happened yet so the guards were too early when they swooped and the and the soldiers and they didn't have enough intelligence to find these master bunkers never did they never found them i mean they continued up until decommissioning it was almost like it didn't have an official name, but it was almost like got Mallard, you know, dragged out that they still kept doing. Yeah. And that's where they were a bit more successful. It was almost like, the, you know, it was almost bursting at the seams. It was, it was only like apart from once you moved them out of these master dumps, it was almost too much. So that, the, you know, the guards, and I'm not, I'm not to undermine invariably their, their successes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Almost invariably. It was so much of it. Well, what was that the thing? The quote you book was enough weapons to start a civil war. And yeah. win. So with a massive amount of weapons, what position were the IRA in by the end of the 80s? I, I'm not sure, it's, it's, it, to be honest. Like, materially, yeah, they were in the best position in, in the history of the organization. You know, even going back to the 20s, materially they were in that. But they almost they didn't have the, you know, the capacity to, to use what they had. They didn't have you know, to exploit what they had. Um, and you're right, you know, the, the, the intelligence game was really ramping up. Uh, brilliant book, if, if you've if you haven't read it or if you have um, a guy called uh, Lee Heed, the intelligence war against the IRA and he but he basically systematically kind of addresses all the um, let's say all the um, accepted narrative about how you know the, the British had kind of got on top of the IRA by the 90s and he and really kind of, you know and it's an academic book it is a bit dry but it's 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 very convincing and compelling that like his argument is that by no means had the British got on top of the IRA in terms of intelligence by the time of the ceasefire and, and therefore the ceasefire was not as a result of like they were constantly changing tactics you know in the early 70s 71, 72 um, the IRA you know Eamon McCann famously said like Derry City centre looked like it had been hit by the Blitz like they there was you know at one point I think there was only two shops on the main street in Derry that were open that hadn't been bombed you know, and that was the economic bombing campaign. And then they had, you know, they, they were trying different tactics or... or yeah, and then well, they land over in the UK and like, yeah. And re yeah. Uh, what's it, reducing scorched earth kind of where they were going after barracks. Exactly. And, and so so this is the thing is like, you know, in, in the in the early 80s, they went back to attacking um, barracks in England. And, you know, and there was several, you know, and, and soldiers, you know, the Hyde Park and Regent Park bombing. And then there was like Deal Barracks and, and um, Woolwich and stuff. You know, they hadn't done the economic bombing in London by that point. 92 was the first big one. So, you know, it's funny when you think about the, the weapons that come in from Libya. At no point at that time were they thinking of, you know, that that strategy. So they, their strategy was constantly evolving. So it's hard to say, like, at any given point, um, would they have would they have lost? Because there were strategies they didn't even know that they were going to adapt, you know, even a few years before when they were engaged on this. You know, and as we know, like what happened in, in London, like that's what... You know, my view anyway, that's what brought the British to the table. He's talking about the Canary Wharf bombing here, which was a bombing that the IRA carried out in London in 1996, which caused £150 million worth of damage and two fatalities. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they were literally told, they were told by um, Lloyds, they said, we can't guarantee any building in London anymore. Frankfurt was on the precipice of taking over as being the prime um, financial capital of Europe at the time. It was angling to do it, and all those um, banks were looking to jump right at the time when the British went into negotiations. So, you know, the IRA didn't know this at the time. It was kind of reported, but they didn't, maybe they weren't keeping an eye on it to that point or it wasn't their main priority. But like, how close, you know, Brit, not, Britain wasn't going to face bankruptcy or anything, but how close they were to kind of losing that prime position in Europe financially, 
is, is something that's really worth thinking about. And, and just to say, like, the final thing on that, you know, although there was some Semtex using those bombs, that was that was homemade explosives. You know, that was stuff they could have done in 1970 in terms of, like, their capabilities. So it's, it's, it's kind of mad to think, like, what did the Lippian weapons actually do? And some people would argue that they were just used as leverage in the negotiations. Well, the, the stat I came across, but again, how do you answer this properly, Nick, is that damn near all of the bombs post-1987 contained some uh, an amalgamation of Semtex, I guess. But So they were still using the fertilizer bombs then, as they were still kind of the, yeah. the bread and butter. Big time, yeah. As we winded down the interview, I asked Geroj if there was anything else he wanted to mention that hadn't come up during our chat. I just tell you, I, like, this is a funny anecdote. Or it's not even a funny anecdote, but it, it's an anecdote about the Exxon. And I was talking to, um, I was talking to someone about this not too long ago. The one of the things that it actually did was it introduced a kind of a, a problem for the IRA, where people became lackadaisical with their with their weapons. So, like before that, there was there was, there was such a premium, you know, it was, it was so rare to get an assault rifle or a good weapon or something that you'd use it again and again. So, like let's say you were driving you know and you were bringing it somewhere to an arms dump and you might get you, you get caught by the guards and that you know they were able to trace that weapon to several different crimes and then you go to jail for these things and you you had nothing to do with it so it was very dangerous you know to be caught with a wep- a hot weapon basically yeah because of the accent or sorry because of the, the shipments that came in pre accent people were using weapons and throwing them away almost and it actually had to come down from above like lad you can't do this you know you have, you have to keep these <laughs> You know, but like that just shows how much they had that, you know, for the first time in their existence that they could just be like, I don't, I, you know, I've used this once. I don't want to be caught with this because, you know, I, I shot a British soldier with it. So let's just dump it. And there was like, lads, like, we'll, we'll run out eventually if we keep doing this. So why did, why did they come to the peace table? Why did they come to the peace talks then for just four or five, six years later, if they were in such a strong position? Yeah, well, my, my view, like this, just my own personal view of it and... You know, and, and I would disagree with, you know, like um, other people who, who've been on the podcast is, I think you look at people like Jerry Adams, Danny Morrison, their kids were in their early 20s, a lot of them at the time, or teenagers, and they just said, like, we, we can't pass this on to them. You know, and, and that's something that I, I, you know, I struggle with sometimes when I talk to Republicans in the South who say, oh, they sold out. It's like, well, you weren't living there. You know, you weren't seeing your grandchildren. You know, you grew up with it in the early 70s and now your grandchildren are growing up with it. You'd do anything to make sure that doesn't happen. You know, and I, I don't think people account for the human element enough of like, you know, I mean, you, you talk to anyone who has kids, you know, and they, they, like who's who would willingly pass that on to their children? You know, growing up with that kind of horrific, just routine violence. You know, I was talking to a fellow in, in Belfast there recently and the um, family friend. And he was talking about the Saracens, you know, the big, huge armored cars. He says, you know, they drive them deliberately down the streets, the narrow streets that had cars parked on both sides and just tear the wind, the wing mirrors off, you know, and just destroy the cars. And they just do that for the crack. And and I just, I, I was saying, and I said, can you remind me what's a Saladin? Because I remember, you know, that's another kind of armored car. And he just said, oh, it's a Saracen with a 50 cal on top. And you just think like, mad, like, you know, a city of Belfast and you have a 19 year old who's in this thing and he's sit, sitting there with a heavy machine gun, a belt fed heavy machine gun. Try, and you think like, would you let, would you want your kids to grow up seeing that and, and the danger of that and a trigger, ha- you know, so I, that personally, that's my view of, of why it ended, you know. That brings us to the end of my chat with Garage. If you enjoyed hearing what he had to say, his new book is called A Broad Church, Volume 2. The Provisional IRA in the Republic of Ireland, 1980 to 1989, and you can get it over on irishacademicpress.ie. The previous volume is also available to purchase there. I really enjoyed this interview, and I want to take the time again to thank him for this very eye-opening and interesting chat. If you enjoyed this episode, please do let me know, and I might have him on again for a chat. So that's it from me. Thanks, and see you next time.